Bibles and turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians in the New Testament chapter 2. Remember the, the, the easy little thing that taught you to find the books of the New Testament. Remember, go eat popcorn. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. So we'll be in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, we're going to begin with verse 1. Apostle Paul writes, For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. For their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance and understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith as you have been taught abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. Plain jumpers. Pray. Heavenly Father, I just come to you this morning. I thank you for the for your word. I thank you for the chance to preach it today, Lord. I, I pray, God, that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord, and that you would speak uh, to me and that you would speak through me what you have for us to hear today. Lord, I pray that you would take your word today and touch our heart with us, Lord. I pray that souls would be saved and lives would be changed today for your glory. I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Plane jumpers. I uh, so I, I'm a big Western movie fan. You know, I, I like the, the Western genre, and uh, you know, one of my favorite sort of aspects of that is the whole the prospector, <clears throat> the old the old grubby prospector who who's panning for gold out, you know, in the Yukon or something, and he he strikes it rich. He finds gold and he finds treasure and and uh, and and becomes rich. Um, Paul is here telling us um, that we are, in fact, a recipients of a treasure, not a treasure of gold like the prospector would be, but we're, uh, we're recipients of a great treasure in Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, one of the things about the prospector <clears throat> was that he always had to be on guard because there was always somebody trying to steal his claim. There was always somebody... Uh, trying to, to steal his treasure that he found. So he had to be on constant guard, whether they shot him for it or they somehow tricked him out of it, swindled it out of him, or beat him to the claim office to, to steal it away from him. He always had to be on guard to guard this treasure that he had found. Paul in Colossians is telling, telling the church and telling us that we have to constantly be on guard uh, lest... Uh, you know, let someone steal that treasure away. And, and the great claim jumper, uh, of course, is Satan. He comes to steal and kill and destroy. So Paul is basically telling us here to be on guard lest, lest someone steal our treasure away. False, uh, false teachers have become a problem in the, in the Colossian church. Paul is writing this from prison, actually. He's in prison in Rome, and so and he's writing this this letter uh, to uh, the Colossian church, but he says, oh, he's not limiting it to that. He says, I also want you to share it with uh, the church at Laodicea, and I want you to uh, uh, share it with as many as have not seen my face. In other words, people that I haven't gotten around to visit with personally, uh, this is still important information for them. So it's important information for us as well. We haven't laid eyes on Paul physically, but Paul has advice for us today in Colossians chapter 2. Um, so he's talking about things that will cost you your treasure. Not necessarily 
losing your salvation. That's what, that's what everybody automatically thinks when, when I start talking about losing your treasure in Christ. Oh, well, you're talking about losing your salvation. Paul's not talking about that, and, and I'm not either. I'm talking about losing uh, the, the joy and the deep things of the Lord that He intends, the fullness of Christ that He intends for you to have. So, uh, we're going to talk about things that will cost you your treasure uh, in Christ. And we're going to look, to do that, we're going to look at how a claim jumper operates. So I want you to kind of re- return with me now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. Um, oh, okay, never mind. I'm not, I'm not that old. Y'all should have gotten that. that. But anyway, uh, I want you to think in terms of, you know, the old west prospector claim jumper kind of deal. And, I'll, and we're going to talk about how a claim jumper would operate. So, um, first way, the primary way that a claim jumper would steal your treasure away, it, it, I mean, that he would take it away, he wants to steal it away. I mean, that's the, that's the simplest way, easiest way to steal it away. Satan wants to steal it from you if he can. That, that's, his, that's his goal. So, in verse 5, Paul says that he is, uh, though he's in prison, he perceives that he's uh, with them in the Spirit. By the Spirit, he perceives that he's with them. He says, uh, though I'm absent in the flesh, yet I'm with you in spirit, and I rejoice to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. He, he says in verse 1 that, that uh, I want to speak not only to, to you, but to Laodicea, to all who have not seen him. And Paul's prayer in verse 2 is this. I want, I'm praying that your hearts would be knit together. He's talking to the church here. I'm praying that your hearts would be knit together, that that, that we would be at peace, that the church would be at peace with one another, and that you would be encouraged, uh, being knit together in love, and, notice in verse 2, attaining to all the riches and the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both the Father and Christ. So here's what he's saying. I, I I want you to... Delve into the great riches, the great treasure of knowing Christ fully. Paul understood something, that, that the full meaning of Christ, the full meaning of, of, of God is not disclosed superficially on the surface. You, you don't get that by just a casual acquaintance with Jesus. You don't get that by just you know, uh, reading the Bible every once in a while or coming to church every once in a while. Uh, but it, it, it is reserved for those who work at it, who dig for it, who dig for the treasure and seek that deep relationship uh, with Christ. Just like in any other relationship. If you have a marriage relationship and, and you only come home some of the time and you never talk to one another and you never go anywhere or do anything together, you're not going to have a very deep relationship in your marriage. The same is true with Christ. He desires us to have a deep and full and meaningful relationship with Him. <clears throat> but that's a treasure that's reserved for those who are willing to, uh, to do the work uh, to get there, to spend the time, uh, to, count, to count and pay the cost of serving Christ. Um, in Christ, an infinite treasure of wisdom awaits to be explored by, by patient meditation and advancing spiritual maturity. Do you see that as a treasure? I think some people see it as a drudgery. Uh, I love studying the Bible. I, I love coming to church. I, I love uh, searching out and seeking out a deeper relationship with Jesus. It's not a drudgery. Uh, it, it's a great joy and a great uh, uh, treasure to be desired. You know, the gold prospectors, the miners, they, they, uh, they work long hours. And it took them a long time. Sometimes it took them their whole life to ever find that treasure. But it wasn't work to them. I mean, you've heard of gold fever. They, I mean, they, all they could think about was how great that treasure was going to be when they found it. So it, it, long hours or hard work didn't matter to them. All that mattered was finding that treasure. Now, Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven being like a treasure that was hidden in a field. When a man fought, found it, he immediately he hid it again and went out and, and sold everything he had and bought that field because it was worth it to him. Satan, his desire, the great claim jumper, Satan, his desire is to 
to steal your treasure in Christ. Now, you can't steal your salvation if you, if you know Christ as your Savior, but He wants to steal all the benefits of it. He wants to steal uh, the fruit of it. So He wants to take from you things like joy and hope and faith and love. He, he wants to get you where, where you're, you're discouraged all the time rather than joyful. He wants to get you where you're worried all the time rather than hopeful. He wants to get you where you're doubting all the time rather than living in faith. He wants to get us fighting amongst one another instead of operating in love. See, a claim jumper's favorite strategy is based on your laziness. The, 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 the claim jumpers in the Old West, they banked on one thing that the person, the prospector, was going to be too lazy to, to do their due diligence to get their claim filed. And so how a lot of claim jumpers actually operated is they would, they would wait till you come into town and you were living it up because you'd found your treasure. And they find out they, where, your, where your treasure is, where you found this gold, and then they beat you to the claim office. And they file a claim for that piece of ground or you can get down there. And then legally, it's theirs because they have the claim. Because you, you were so excited that you, you didn't think about it. You, well, I'll get around to it later. I, you know, I'll get down to the claim office later. I'll do the paperwork later. And so they banked on your laziness to, uh, to steal your claim away. Satan works the same way. He's banking on the fact that you're going to be lazy when it comes to seeking out the treasures in Christ. He's banking on the fact that, that you're not going to dig out the deep things of God's Word. He's banking on the fact that you're not going to spend your time praying. That, that, you're, that you're going to have a casual acquaintance with church, but not, not really be a, an integral part of it. He's banking on the fact of your laziness to steal all of the treasure away. So, the joy goes away, the hope goes away, the peace goes away. All of those things that you're supposed to have in Christ, He can take it away if, if He can just get you too lazy to dig for it. Um, my family and I took a, a vacation several years ago when the boys were little. We went to Yellowstone and then from there uh, on to South Dakota and saw the Black Hills of South Dakota. And the, But we toured a, a a gold mine when we were in South Dakota. The Broken Boot Gold Mine in the Black Hills of South Dakota. And, uh, you know, they had the little guy, he, he uh, had his little flashlight, he toured us, took us down, gave us the tour of the gold mine and everything. And, but he would show us these veins of gold that were in the, in the mine. You know? and here's gold here, and there's some more gold here. And this, this, um, this streak here, uh, you know, this quartz or whatever probably, you know, is a, is a sign that there's gold near here and all this stuff, you know. Well, somebody in our little tour group asked, said, uh, well, if there's all this gold in here, why don't, why doesn't somebody come in here and dig it out? I mean, why don't they get, you know, people in here and mine it out? He said, well, it would cost more to dig it out than what it's worth. He said, we can make, he kind of winked and grinned, he said, we can make more selling tours than we can digging gold. And I guess, you know, knowing what I paid for the price of the tour ticket, he's probably right about that. But uh, I thought about that. I thought, man, that's, that's kind of crazy. You got, you got a, a mine full of gold here, but it costs too much to dig it out. So it just stays there. I thought, you know, that's a, the way a lot of people treat things of Christ. There, there, is, a, there is a gold mine to be had in Christ. Uh, there is treasures beyond our wildest uh, imagination in Christ. But Satan banks on us being too lazy. Dig it out. Too lazy to really read my Bible. Too lazy to really pray. Too lazy to really uh, dig in deep in church and begin to serve the Lord. Too lazy uh, to put the things of the world uh, to the side so that I can focus on the things of Christ. He banks on us being too lazy. And He simply steals the real treasure 
away because He convinces us that it would cost more to get it than what it's worth. Let me tell you something. It doesn't matter what the cost. It's worth it in Christ. Whatever the cost. Jesus said, count the cost. Uh, if, you, uh, if you're going to be a, a follower of Christ, we're, we're told to count the cost. It's worth it. But Satan, the great claim jumper, wants to steal it away. Um, second way they operate is they, they want to get you to waste it away. They, they, want, you to, they want you to waste your treasure. Uh, in, if they can't steal it outright, they, they want to get you uh, to, to basically waste it on the things of the world. Um, so in the, if you watch Old West movies, every, every mining town in the Old West uh, had all sorts of uh, ways for miners to spend their gold. All forms of debauchery. Saloons and brothels and casinos and every every imaginable uh, house of ill repute that could be uh, in a in a town. There was you know in all, you look at the history of these old west towns. There was far more saloons than there were churches in these towns. They might only have one church and very few people went to that, but they'd have a dozen saloons in them because the, these people they were smart. They thought. Well, why go out and, and work and, and, and try you know spend my life you know at a you know digging rocks out of a mine or, or panning for gold down by the river? I'll just wait till somebody gets the gold for me, and then they'll come into town, and then we'll have all of these opportunities for them to spend their their treasure they found, so that we'll end up with all the treasure, and they won't have any. Satan operates that way. Uh, he wants to get you. To, to give away, basically, all that you have in Christ. He wants, to, he wants to, you to, to, to get so involved in the things of the world that, that you'll trade joy, real joy, for momentary pleasure. Uh, or uh, trade real uh, hope for uh, something like luck that doesn't exist anyway. Uh, he, he wants you to, um, to uh, trade the, the patience that we find in Christ uh, for uh, the here and now. The Colossian church was plagued by false teachers and, and, and they, were, they were working to try to get the Christians in, in Colossae to, uh, to give up their, their, their treasure in Christ. To, 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 to trade it away. Paul, though he was in, in prison, he, he perceived that he was with He said, I, I may be in prison in Rome, but, but I'm still with you in the Spirit. You know, now, that's a term that gets thrown around a lot. You know? Uh, you know, I, I mean, sometimes you'll talk to people and they say, well, we ain't seen you in church in a year or two. I say, yeah, I'm with you in spirit. I'm thinking, well, I think the Lord wants you to be with us in person, not, you know, uh, but Paul didn't mean it that. Paul couldn't, Paul couldn't be with them in, in person because he was locked away in prison. But he said, look, my spirit is knit to yours. We, we share a common Lord and a common purpose. And so I'm telling you these things because I love you and I, I want to help you. And I don't want to see these false teachers try to steal and, and trick you into giving away your treasure and all the things that you have in the Lord. He said, I, I want you to walk in a steadfastness of faith. Look at verse 5. Though I'm absent with you in the flesh, and yet I am with you in the Spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ as you have received Christ. In other words, he says, I know you, you've received Christ. You're a Christian. So walk in Him. In other words, he's saying this. Look, I know you're a Christian. Live like you do. Act like you do. It's not enough just to say, I'm a Christian that I believe in Jesus. We should live our life like we believe in Jesus. And notice what he, what he says in verse 6 and 7. But walk in Him, <clears throat> rooted and built up in Him, established in faith, and having been taught and abounding with thanksgiving. He, he describes it this way. Be rooted, be built up, be established, and abounding in it. All of this in 
in this faith that we have in Christ. That's what it means to walk in Him. I should be rooted in the faith, built up in the faith, established in the faith, and abounding in it with thanksgiving, he says. So the claim jumper, his next favorite strategy, if he can't, if he can't steal it away from you, if he can't catch you being lazy enough, his next, his next favorite strategy is to get you to waste your treasure on the, on the ways of the flesh. And Satan operates the same way. He, if, he can't, if he can't steal it outright, if he can't trick you out of it, his next option is to try to get you so involved in the things of the world that, you, that you're missing out on the biggest part of your treasure. There's now a, apparently a, a new psychological or emotional disorder called FOMO. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of it. You probably have. It stands for fear of missing out. And it has to do with people now because... We're so connected, apparently, uh, through social media and all of this um, uh, different, different ways that, that we're constantly bombarded by what everybody else is doing and what everything else is going on in the world. And people now, uh, like they, they'll stay on their phone and then social media like 24 hours a day because they have this fear of missing out that something's going on in the world and I'm not going to be there to enjoy it. Somebody's having fun and it ain't me and i got to be there, right? And, and it's really, I mean, it's... A, it's actually a psychological disorder, apparently. Um, I thought, but it's not new. I mean, you know, they, they, they say it's new. I mean, apparently it, it manifests itself in a new way through social media now. But it's not really new. It's been Satan's strategy all along to try to convince us as Christians that you're somehow missing it. If you, if you really try to serve the Lord, if you, if you go to church, if you read your Bible, Look at all the fun in the world. Look, look at everything that's going on in the world that's fun. And, and, you, and there you are just staying home reading your Bible and going to church on Sunday. Think of all that you're missing out. And, and, and he convinces us, he convinces people that the only way that you can ever uh, enjoy life is to be involved in the things of the flesh. So we jump headlong into the things of the flesh and the next thing we know, we're not enjoying life at all because we've, we've traded away, we've wasted away the, the things of, uh, of the Lord, the treasures, the real treasures of, of a life lived for Him. We've wasted it on the things of the world, the things of the flesh. You know, you, uh, I don't know why it is, but the best commercials are always the beer commercials. The one that gets me is the, the, the one that's the most interesting man alive. Sharks have a week just dedicated just to him. All this goofy stuff. And you know, you watch this and you think, man, the, the, only, the only way you can ever have fun in life is to, to drink beer. But that's not true. I mean, the, the best times of my whole life I've had, uh, and I've never had a beer in my hand. But the lie is, oh, well, you got to do this, and you gotta, you got to go here, and you got to have this, and you got to... You got to do all of these things of the world to really enjoy life, and in the time, the moment you begin to think that Satan's got you, see, and, and while he might not be able to take your salvation away, he can take your treasure. So gone is the joy, gone is the hope, and, and so now you're the most miserable person at all because you're living like a, a lost person, and yet you're supposed to be a Christian, and so you're not happy in either case. You're not really happy as a sinner because you know that's not who you are, but you're not, ha you're not happy as a Christian because you're not living like who you're supposed to be in Christ. And Satan's got you. And he's stolen your treasure. Another way that a claim jumper will get your treasure away is to swindle it away. To swindle, to cheat you in some way. Uh, he says, um, verse 8, Paul says, Beware lest anyone cheat you. And he's talking about the... the the false teachers here, through, uh, through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men. He says, don't let anybody cheat you out of this treasure that you have in Christ. So, claim jumpers will try to trick you into selling your claim for a song. You know, they, they, they'll try to convince you that, oh, well, that old piece of dirt out there ain't worth nothing, but I'll give you, you know, I'll give you more than what it's worth, and so... 
poor prospector he signs over his claim, and, and he is basically giving away his treasure for pennies on the dollar. In other words, sell out. That's, that's, the, that's the temptation. That's the strategy. Uh, I want to get you to sell out. Satan wants to do that to us. He wants to try to get us to sell out, compromise in some way. Verse 8, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. In other words, this idea that, well, man is smarter than God. So it doesn't matter what the Bible says. Listen to me. I've got all the answers. You know? And Satan will send people like that into your life. Well, I know the Bible says this, but Anytime that somebody says to you, I know the Bible says this, but you just need to walk away from them right then. Stop listening to them because they're fixing to tell you a lie. Because there is no, I know the Bible says this, but. If the Bible says it, that's the way it is. But Satan wants to try to uh, confuse that, and he'll throw false teachers in your way uh, to, to try to do that. Paul describes this philosophy uh, of the false teachers in three ways. He says it's man-made. It's demonic, and it's not according to Christ. So leave it alone, he says. In Christ, our treasure is complete. Look at verse 9. In Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In other words, in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him. That means that there is nothing more that can be added to you outside of Jesus Christ. Everything you are, everything you're supposed to be is wrapped up in Jesus Christ. You are full. You are complete. You don't need anything else if you've got Jesus. That's all you need. Um, in Christ, our treasure is complete. So a claim jumper will try to, to get you to sell out if all else fails. If he can't steal it, uh, if, if he can't uh, get you to waste it on the things of the world, his next... his, his his final effort, his last ditch effort, is to try to get you to sell out, compromise. Let's trade. Let's make a trade. That's the way Satan wants. Well, let's let's make a trade. I'll I'll take I'll take the things of the Lord from you, and you take the things of the world from me. Let's make a trade. You know, I uh, I don't know. I guess I've always kind of collected different things. One of the first things I ever started collecting was old coins. And I started collecting that because my dad, uh, he collected old coins. And he had, I mean, like, he had a really good collection. I mean, he had, like, the, the for real silver dollars and, like, a, a three-cent piece, which some of you probably don't know there was ever such a thing as a three-cent piece, but there was uh, an old for real silver half dollars and all kinds of stuff like that. And, and uh, I was about probably about six or seven years old. And, uh, you know, he'd get it out in the, in the evening. He had it on a little cigar box, you know. He'd get his coins out, and if he got a new coin, he'd look at it, you know, and he'd show it to me, and I, I'd, I'd admire it, you know. And it was kind of something we did together. And I got, but I got, to, I got him on to him one day about, you know, hey, I, Dad, I want, I want a coin collection too. He said, well, you know, you can have this one when I'm gone. I don't, I mean, I, I want to be a part of it. I want to collect coins too. So he said, well, so he got me a little cigar box and he gave me some coins. And I don't mean they were just like, you know, wheat tail pennies and buffalo nickels. I mean, he gave me some that were actually worth the money. I mean, he, he gave me like, you know, the, the Morgan silver dollars and the, 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 the walk in liberty half dollars and, uh, you know, some of, the, some of the ones that were actually, you know, worth more. He gave me, you know, dimes that were worth far more than 10 cents kind of deal, you know. I had all in my little cigar box, and I was so proud. I had this little neighbor kid. He was, he was a couple of years older than me. I mean, as a rattlesnake, but, you know, that, that, that's all right, I guess. Um, anyway, uh, but I, I was so proud, and I, so I took my little, my little cigar box full of money outside, and I was showing that neighbor kid. Now, that was a mistake. I, I should have never done that, but I, I didn't know. I was like six or seven years old, and I was so proud that I had my coin collection. And... Uh, and he says, oh, and I'm showing him, you know, this is a half dollar, and blah, 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 going through it all. Said, hey, that's cool. He says, well, why don't you give me some so I can have a collection too? I said, no, I'm not giving this one. Oh, this, this is mine. My daddy gave me this. Says, oh, well, I'll buy something. Here, here's, 
here's a nickel. I'll buy that buffalo nickel from you for this. But this, this is brand new. It's worth. I said, no, no, we're not doing that. And they try, you know, can you tell he was getting frustrated? He said, well, I got a collection too. I said, you do? He said, yeah. I'll go in the house and I'll get it. So he went in and he brought out this stack about yay big of baseball cards. Now, you got to understand, this is, when I say baseball cards, this is not like the, the Honus Wagner, you know, that there's only five of them in the world. This isn't a Nolan Ryan rookie card that signed or anything like that. This is those players that nobody ever heard of. Uh, you would have had to, I mean, they played like when I was a kid, and you could get a half a dozen cards in a package with a stick of bubble gum for a dollar, you know. I mean, nobody had ever heard of them. They weren't worth anything. Uh, the, the only thing that made the, you know, it was the gum that made the, 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 uh, the package worth what you paid for it in the first place. He had this stack, and he, but he, oh, he was a salesman. He, well, you know, a little 10-year-old, you know, shark, you know, and, Oh, it's this, this, this right here. This is someone call some name. I'll be like, I never heard of them. Well, you don't follow baseball, man. This is future Hall of Famer right here. He's like, uh, he's like, well, uh, tell you what I'll do. He says, if you want to trade me, this, I'll, I'll, I don't really want to get rid of this card, but if you want to trade me that half dollar there for this card, I'll take it. Well, that's, he said, oh, man, this thing's going to be worth, you know, $100 one day. Oh, well, then this half dollar, that's a good deal. So he'd trade that. And then now this one right here, this, this here is a rookie card of, you know, somebody, you know, never heard of. You wouldn't, I could call the name today, you wouldn't even know that he was ever a baseball player. He, he probably, you know, washed out after his rookie season. Oh, man, he's, he's going to be a big star one day. You know, he's going to win the World Series and all this goofy stuff. He's, oh, yeah, I says, well, I'll have to have that silver dollar. For that. Well, okay. So we went through this whole deal. Uh, he, he traded me all of his baseball cards that weren't worth anything for all my little little box of old money. And when it was all said and done, I had about six coins left in a stack of baseball cards about this high. Then I had to go back inside. Daddy met me at the door. He'd been watching me through the window. He didn't stop me. He just watched me. He said, what are you doing? Oh, I was out there visiting Brett, is his name. I was out there visiting Brett. He says, well, then the, what are you doing with your, with your money box? Oh, I was just doing a little trading. Doing a little trading. What did you trade for? Well, I've got these baseball cards. Where's your money? I opened my box, and there's about six retail pennies and a buffalo nickel in there. And I, I never seen my, that look on my daddy's face before. I mean, I, I, I wish that he'd have hollered at me and beat me. I mean, I could have gotten over that. I mean, I'd have been, I mean, the bruises would have healed a long time ago if, if that was what he did. But the look of disappointment in my daddy's eyes, I still, I never, I still haven't gotten over it. I mean, it was like he was crushed. Like, I gave you this great treasure that was, that, that was precious to me, and you traded away for, for something that's worth it. I've often thought, when I read passages like this, where Paul warns us not to, not to let anyone cheat us out of the treasures of Christ, I wonder what it will be like to stand before Jesus on that day and look in His eye and see the look of disappointment when He says, I gave you the greatest treasure, precious to me. I, I, gave, I gave my own life for you. You had it all. And you traded it away for a song. For, for the, the nothingness of this world. See, in Christ, the treasure is yours. Satan can't rightfully take it from you. But you have, you, you have the rightful claim to it, but beware of the ultimate claim jumping. His desire is only to steal and to kill and destroy. Hold on to the treasure that you have. Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I do thank you for your word and how you speak to us. Lord, as we, as we come to this time of invitation and decision, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, convict us of our sin and our need for you. I pray, Lord, that you would search our hearts.